welcome to the Fallon Forum. This is Kathy Burns filling in for Ed Fallon, who unfortunately has laryngitis. There are people who would argue the unfortunately part, but I miss his voice. I'm going to take a minute or two to thank our local business partners in the Des Moines metro area before we talk to our guest, John Delaney. Thanks to Gateway Market and Cafe. That's our grocery store and a great place for breakfast, lunch, and supper. Gateway also has a catering service featuring a wide variety of options. That's Gateway Market and Cafe. Thanks to Story County Veterinary Clinic, where Dr. Kim Holding has been treating creatures great and small over 30 years. Endorsed by our cat, Mika, a flock of laying hens, and our pet elephant. Oh, okay, kidding about the elephant. Thanks to Ritual Cafe, located on 13th Street in downtown Des Moines, fair trade coffees, fair trade tea, an all vegetarian menu, and an alluring venue for music, art, and so much of Des Moines' best cultural offerings. That's Ritual Cafe. Noche is Central Iowa's premier home for jazz and cabaret, attracting both national acts and local favorites and featuring a world-class cocktail bar. Check out Noche, located on Walnut Street, just south of the Sculpture Park in downtown Des Moines. And thanks to Hawk Restaurant in Des Moines' historic East Village. Chef Suman Hawk sources 90% of the food served from Iowa farmers and Iowa producers. That's Hawk, H-O-Q, restaurant. We're here today with John Delaney. Thank it's you great to be here. here. Um, you're in the cultural and culinary crossroads of America, Des Moines. Indeed, and I'm, I'm happy to be here. And you've been to all of Iowa's 99 counties. I have. It's been an amazing experience traveling around the, um, at the state. I've learned so much. I think I've done about 500 events in the state, you know, in people's living rooms and coffee shops and, you know, community centers or on farms, big farms, mm -hmm. small farms mm -hmm. and schools. It's just been great. And I know you focused a lot of that on rural Iowa. Indeed. Okay. Yeah, because I think one of the big challenges and opportunities, because every challenge is also an opportunity that we have in this country right now is what's happening to small town America. You know, they're shrinking and they're aging. Mm -hmm. And that's putting huge pressure on their public uh, education system, their healthcare system. And it's creating a situation where there's no opportunities for young people. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really a, a very bad economic situation. And that's a huge problem for the people in that town. But it's also a problem for the whole country because our democracy is predicated on the fact that we should have broad-based economic growth. Because big states like California have two U.S. senators and small, more rural states mm -hmm. also have two. Mm -hmm. So we have to have the economy working everywhere. But I also think it's an opportunity for these places because what's happening in the world right now with high cost of housing in big cities and with technology being able to connect people, you know, and I think um, a lot of, we're gonna talk a lot about climate, I think there's a lot of opportunities to locate a lot of our climate strategies in rural America, that I think we could have a renaissance, but we need the right policies. And, and I would say this has become a huge part of my campaign and I think it's what distinguishes me from so many of the other candidates because I'm really focused on things that will help these small towns. One of the things I hear candidates saying in the, de the Democratic Party is we need to go into these small towns, and I'm from a small town mm -hmm. in western Iowa, Harlan. Hey, Harlan. And um, I hear people say sometimes we need to go in there and, and share our ideas and tell them how we're going to fix things. And I, I see you shaking your yeah. head. Tell me, tell me what you're doing. There's a lot of arrogance floating around in politics <laughs> these days. So I think it's in some ways we have to listen mm -hmm. to, to the people in these towns because you see things that are working. And I think we can also learn from other communities. You know, there's a great um, writer for the Atlantic Magazine, James Fallows, his name is. And he wrote a piece a couple of years ago where he took his single engine prop plane and he flew around the whole United States. And he went to 77 towns that had really done well in the last 10 years, smaller towns. Mm -hmm. They were in the south, they were in the west, they were in the heartland, they were in the northeast, they were everywhere. And he tried to distill down what they had in common. And you saw some patterns, good community colleges, a situation where government, the private sector, and the nonprofit sector worked really well together. Mm -hmm. They had heroes in their communities, people who really stepped forward and made a difference. They had good healthcare systems because people aren't gonna to move to a community unless they know there's a good hospital. And so there were some common themes that we should be observing, but we also have to create incentives for people to set up businesses there and move there. 
But every one of these communities, as you know, Harlan or whatever the case may be, they have their own unique identity and their own unique distinguishing features. So you want to build on the character of these communities, but create an environment where the basic things people want, a good hospital, good school, some cultural activities, are there. Great, great. Uh, so you've got a few more small towns to visit yep. coming up in January. And I noted you'll be in Defiance on mm -hmm. the 13th. They were part of our school system uh, at Harlan Community High mm -hmm. when I grew up. Mm -hmm. And uh, also you'll be in Humiston mm -hmm. on the 14th. I taught there for two years. Oh my gosh. The years that I taught. Oh, oh, yeah. I technically taught it in Garden Grove. In the elementary or middle or high school? Where'd you teach? The middle and high school. I see. Great. Super. Yeah. yeah. Super. So good luck. In yeah. No, I'm excited. That should be exciting. Um, so since you... you you said that you had been the only candidate to tour all 99 counties, and I believe Amy Klobuchar yes. has done that since then. Yes, I, uh, this is now another candidate who's done it. Okay, great. Um, you mentioned that you're sure we'll be talking a lot about climate, and mm -hmm. you nailed it. Uh, yes. I, I took a look at your website, and you list four issues, really, that you're very concerned with. Uh, better care or universal health care. Universal health care, yeah. Climate change economic opportunity, mm -hmm. fixing our broken politics. Thank you for putting climate change as one of those top yes. issues. Yes. Um, so many so many times people say it's a top issue, but they don't talk about it, right. they don't list it. So um, I, I did also note some parts of your climate plan and uh, what's, what to me is, or what to you is the most important part of that plan right now? Well, I, I think of what, one of the things that distinguishes my plan, and, and let's face it, all the Democrats running for president have great climate plans. Mm -hmm. We would be blessed if any of them became the policy and law of the United States of America. So let's, let's start with that. But we all have different approaches. I think one of the differences with my approach is I have solutions to deal with it globally that are unique. Because I do think it is a global challenge. I mean, the United States contributes about 13% of the greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. So we do need to lead on the other 87%. Now, we can't lead on that unless we get our own house in order because you have to lead by example. But we also have to use the position of the presidency of the United States of America, which is the most important leader in the world, let's face it, to lead globally. So I have a strong global orientation. And I also have uh, a big focus on innovation. Because mm -hmm. I actually believe in 50 years, if we get our policy right, the way we produce, distribute, and conserve energy can and should be entirely different in this country. Uh, and yeah. to get there, you know, in a way that's completely um, carbon free, we're going to need some new innovations. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to need some new battery technologies. And this is where it's really important to think globally, because what's going to happen around the world in the next several decades, which is good, is a billion plus human beings are going to be lifted out of poverty, mostly in Africa, mm -hmm. based on economic development that's occurring around the world. And as you know, when someone goes from being in poverty to out of poverty, which is amazing, by the way, a billion plus people being lifted out of poverty, but we all know they start using a lot more energy when they become part of some form of global middle class. They start moving, they start engaging economically in ways that uses more energy, they start having homes, as opposed to living you know, in, in kind of tents and villages and things like that. And in a lot of these countries, the only alternative they have for energy is fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So I actually think the wealthy countries of the world have an obligation to come up with the new innovations so that these countries can skip ahead, kind of like what happened with uh, cell phones. You know, a lot of uh, the developing world actually never installed wired lines. They skipped right to cell phones. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'd like to see these countries do with energy. I'd like them to skip that whole fossil fuel kind of phase and get right to the next uh, uh, phase, but they can't do that on their own. That's a good way to put it, because yes. if you think of fossil fuel use, that's a, a, a blip on the radar in human history. Yes. And, and we should think of it as a phase. And, and, and we should get these other countries to skip it. Right. right. And Wouldn't that be great? Speaking of fossil fuels, I think I spoke with you at another event some mm -hmm. time ago. I lived on the route of the Dakota Access Pipeline mm -hmm. when it came through Iowa. Yeah. Very traumatic experience. And I, I, saw, I saw the earth get torn up. Mm -hmm. I saw my neighbor's farm get dug into and the pipe go right. in. Um, uh, it's, uh, you, you issued a statement against, mm -hmm. uh, when Ed requested, the yes. doubling of oil flow in the Dakota Access Pipeline. 
um, because Energy Transfer now wants to double the flow of oil from more than half a million right. barrels a day to more than a million right. barrels a day. So thank you for that statement. Um, I just think we should be spending our money in different places. Mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, the thing about the energy infrastructure in this country is it lasts about 20 to 40 years and then it has to be replaced. Mm -hmm. so when and they you, all leak. Well, put it, but yeah, there's all the problems with it, but when you build a big fossil fuel energy infrastructure, once someone's invested the money, you know it's gonna be used for 20 or 40 years. Whereas if you invest the money in, in renewables or alternatives, then it'll be used for 20 or 40 years. Because that's, you know, that's economically how things work. People spend a lot of money to create something and then they have to get their money back. I was one of the first members of Congress to come out against the Keystone Pipeline, for example. Mm -hmm. Because I was like, listen, I don't know how we do this and lead globally. Like, how do we Plus, build this huge yeah. pipeline, bringing the most dirty oil to market there yeah. is? Plus, you know, that what, oil. what these pipelines have done, the Keystone, the Dakota Access Pipeline, what they've done, not just to farmers and landowners, but to indigenous yeah. uh, friends yeah. across, the, across those areas. Yeah. It's been devastating. The, the challenge with these pipelines is trying to figure out which bad thing about them you want to talk about first. <laughs> the, <laughs> That's how I think about it, right? Like, it's a bad example to the world. It allows more fossil mm -hmm. fuels to be used. It disrupts the natural world in terms of the land. It goes through indigenous... I mean, it's just got a lot of issues right. with it. The point that you could help me with, yes. uh, part of your plan is this... Um, uh, is it the carbon CO2 thoroughfare what the carbon throughway carbon throughway yes so I I saw that you were indicating we should have the carbon capture space take place along existing pipeline routes right. throughout the country tell me how that would work because I'm, I'm worried about redigging up all yes. that land I'm glad you brought it up because I think it's an important part of my plan but people often misunderstand it so I actually believe to hit our goals. And I believe our goal is zero, net zero emissions by 2050. That's what the UN climate report mm -hmm. has effectively said. And that's what most of the scientists agree. We have to get to net zero by 2050. That doesn't mean we, we, we shouldn't be doing things sooner. Of course we should be doing things sooner. Right now, 80% of our energy comes from fossil fuels. If we want to get that close to zero by 2050, of course by 2030 and by 2035 and by 2040, we have to be doing big things. But the ultimate goal is to live in a world where we're not putting new CO2 into the atmosphere. And I worry that we won't get there by 2050. Because when I look at things like airplanes, big ships, manufacturing, there are no ways to, to currently do that without producing CO2. So what I want to do is I want to launch a whole new industry called direct air capture. Mm -hmm. This is not carbon capture at fossil fuel plants. I'm not trying to perpetuate fossil fuels. But what I'm envisioning is machines, and they're doing them in Iceland right now. There's a great company called Climate Works, which is um, doing it in Iceland. They're doing it in Sweden. And they effectively have machines that suck the CO2 out of the atmosphere. And when the CO2 is removed from the atmosphere, you can do a couple things with it. You can store it in big cavities in the ground, another can move it right back in the ground. And it can also be used for like carbonation, and there's a bunch of industrial uses that are now, uh, people believe you can use with CO2. And if we put a price on carbon, which I want to do, a carbon tax, and we actually build a direct air capture industry, I think we get to net zero much faster. And so what I'd like to do is locate these technologies in the heartland to be actually literally removing the CO2 from the atmosphere. How, can I, sure. how big is one of these things? Maybe the size of this room. The size of this room. Yeah. We're, we're in a room that's about 13 by 17. Go on, go on the website called Climate Works. Okay. And it's a, it's a European country. They're doing it in Europe and they're doing it in Iceland right now. And um, there, there's a picture of the machines. Okay. And, and if we actually create incentives for these machines, because they don't exist right now, and that's the other thing I call for is ma I want to take all the tax credits we give to fossil fuels and use them for this industry. These machines will get more, much more productive, just like wind turbines 30, 40 years ago were crude compared to what they are now, mm -hmm. but we created incentives for them. And suddenly we innovated and created all these wonderful new wind turbines. And I want to do that with these machines. But once you capture the CO2, you have to transport it. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to transport it in trucks and in trains because that produces more CO2, you see what I mean? So I want to lay a pipeline. 
but not a pipeline that can transport fossil fuels. I want to lay a CO2 pipeline called the CO2 throughway, and I want to put it in existing natural gas right-of-ways. Natural gas pipelines don't nearly have the disruption that these other pipelines okay. do. They're much smaller. And we have all these right-of-ways. Mm -hmm. And I want to lay this CO2 pipeline, and I want to start removing CO2. So when you drive around rural Iowa, you not only see solar panels, you not only see wind turbines, you actually see these incredibly advanced machines saving our planet. And why these machines are important is we're going to need these around the world. In my mind, I'm seeing manufacture jobs, etc. But I'm also seeing a lot of product, a lot of, of earth stores being used to manufacture these big things that are used to capture. The, I, I, I worry about even wind turbines, which as wonderful as wind energy is, yeah. the product that goes into mm -hmm. that, what, what are they made of? What happens when they're no mm -hmm. longer used? Where, where are they disposed of? So I'm, I'm curious also what your thoughts are about just reducing our use of energy. Well, I think we should reduce our use of energy and become more efficient and conserve more. But we also have to be practical. Okay. I'd, you know, I'd like to see the U.S. be a leader in saying we don't need to use all this energy as well. Yes. I know it's the modern thing. I know when people, you said, go from, from uh, poor to, to making it all right, mm -hmm. that they're going to start building or owning homes using energy. And that, that makes me think a little bit, maybe we can find a way to lead on conservation. Using less. I agree with you. But the population of the world is going to continue to grow. Well, I'm done adding to it. <laughs> so there's just going to continue to be a demand. I, I totally agree with you. We, we should clearly be, um, I mean, there's so many wonderful technologies. Like, it wasn't that long ago. Now you go into rooms all the time and the lights go on and off when you mm -hmm. go in and out automatically. I remember it was only 10 years ago that I, when I was in my prior uh, life running my business, we were moving to new offices and I wanted to make them as energy efficient as possible. And that was like new technology back then. Yes. Yeah. And that saves so much energy. Mm -hmm. and people can't You know, how you flush your toilets, all this stuff. Well, you and I grew up during the energy crisis. Yeah. You remember that? Yeah, you and know. It was ingrained in us as kids to yeah, turn Yeah, I, I tell my kids all the time, when you leave a room, shut that light off. Now, you know, what you were trying to, even in our home, have as many of those uh, Automatic things. When you walk okay. in, the lights go on. When you okay. leave, they go off. But that's stuff we got to do. As you travel around Iowa and elsewhere, how are these ideas about climate being received by, really by well. folks? Um, are and, and you're, you've been in agricultural areas. What do you think about the impact of big ag on our climate? And what ideas do you have um, to think about family farms, mm -hmm. even urban farms like Ed and I? Absolutely. Have? Well, big ag has been a problem in a lot of dimensions. Right, they have monopoly power mm -hmm. and they're squeezing farmers. So there's that whole antitrust issue with big ag. But then you have the, the, um, the impact they have on our natural world. And I don't think right now big ag has the incentive to be as sustainable as they could be. And uh, I think small family farms have much more of an incentive because they're more connected to their communities. And I think urban farming is a huge opportunity. Huge opportunity. You know, my wife, um, I'm from New Jersey. My dad was an electrician. I grew up in a blue-collar family, in a two-family house in a blue-collar neighborhood in North Jersey. My wife, April, her dad was a potato farmer in Idaho. So we That's have... That's just fun to say. Only That's in America, fun to say. right? The union electrician's son meets the potato farmer's daughter. So, um, and he had, he had a family farm mm -hmm. in Idaho and a third, gener a th uh, third generation family farm. They actually, when I met her, they actually lost the farm mm -hmm. um, because of the farm crisis in the late 80s. So she has a very strong connection to agricultural communities and family farms. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the reasons they, th they feel like they lost the farm was the late 80s were really tough on farming. There were a lot of very bad things that were happening. And um, there was some big mon agricultural monopolies in Idaho that were trying to consolidate the potato industry and put a lot of pressure on them. So, yeah, I think we got to get back to much more sustainable farming, much more family farms. People want that. People want to know where their stuff is grown. You know, what makes you happy than going into a restaurant and seeing a list of where they got the products from? Oh, we and love that. And knowing they're, like, within 10 miles of where you're... And you can just imagine in your house, like, in a restaurant, when you're about to eat the food, someone locally who actually loves the land mm -hmm. and thinks about how to utilize it the best, raising the crops and bringing it almost in an old-fashioned way to the restaurant. You know, okay. that's what we want. 
And that's that's how Ed and I eat here. We go right outside, dig mm-hmm. potatoes. We're potato farmers too, so yeah. you can tell your tell your wife we have some things. Yeah, some potato farmers. Yeah. <laughs> um, I I did see too that you used to go on construction sites with your yes. dad. We share that in common. My dad had a a, a pole building business for a long time. A pole no, building farm business. buildings oh. in Western Iowa, yeah. and used to go on construction sites yeah. with him. Um, you know, I, as I said, from Western Iowa, that that's a pretty conservative area, mm-hmm. uh, but good good schools, good education, mm-hmm. good people. Um, so I'm I, I'm just wondering, you know, your campaign in general, when you're out there talking to folks, uh, what kind of pushback do you get, and 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 how's the campaign going, all in all? Well, we think it's going well. I'm I'm very much focused on rural Iowa. Because I think I have a, you know, part of this last 30 days I'm doing this trip, we're going to 40 different towns, as you said. And we called it the Send a Message campaign tour. Because I think I'm the only one actually talking about a lot of these issues that really get to turning around the economies of small towns. And if people in those towns think that these issues are important, they need to send a message to the Democratic Party. Because right now, this race is way too nationalized. It's way too focused on the issues that affect people living on the coast. I got nothing against those folks. But we as a party are never going to actually be able to make the progress we need as a nation unless we actually start winning some of these places. When I go to these small towns and look at how they're struggling, these these should be people the Democratic Party is fighting for. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the reasons I've always been so proud to be a Democrat is we fight for the people who are being left behind. And I think right now in America, citizens living in small rural towns are being left behind. And there's lots of reasons for it, how the world's changed, technological innovation and globalization has completely reshaped our economy and caused a concentration of economic activity in big cities. But I think there's an opportunity to spread that out a little more and bring some of the economic opportunities back to small towns. I think that'll make it a, it a more sustainable planet, by the way, as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's what my campaign is about. So I want Iowans, if they care about that issue, I want them to send a message to the DNC and allow me to do better on caucus night than people think. And I promise uh, all those view- all your viewers out there and everyone in small towns that if I do better on caucus night, I'm going to get in front of the television cameras and say, the reason I did well tonight is because of rural Iowa, because I spoke to the issues that matter to rural Iowa. And the Democratic Party should be representing you. Okay. Well, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. It's great. This is Kathy Burns for Ed Fallon on the Fallon Forum. And we'll be back in a moment. Welcome back to the Fallon Forum. Our guest is Jeffrey Weiss. He is a part-time teacher at a local community college teaching political science. Welcome to the show, Jeffrey. Thank you. It's good to be here. A lot has been happening this week um, concerning the president's uh, ordering an attack on on a key official in Iran. Tell Mm -hmm. us a little bit about what's been going on. Okay, boy. (laughs) I'm not sure where to start except to say that um, in the eyes of much of the world, um, and according to international law, um, you know, the assassination of a high-level uh, military official. Um, Soleimani is the top general in Iran. I suppose it would be akin to an assassination of um, David Petraeus at, at the time of, uh, you know, the aftermath of the invasion of Iraq. He not only is the top military official in the um, government of Iran, which, you know, represents 80 million people. Uh, I, whenever I start to talk about Iran, I have to say to a United States audience that the Iranians um, are Persian peoples. Um, they're not Arabs. <laughs> That's okay. an important thing to point out. If you actually look at the history of the word Iran, it's um, one of the translations is the land of the Aryans. Um, they speak an Indo-European language. Um, it's in the class of languages of that about 3.4 billion people speak in the world, including say the people of the United States, <laughs> um, otherwise known as English, <laughs> that is part of an Indo-European language. Um, it's a country that, aside from Israel, is the most pro-United States mm-hmm. in the entire region of the so-called Middle East or Southwest um, Asia in terms of 
Um, the Persians generally make a distinction between the people of the United States um, and the government of the United States and, and U.S. foreign policy. But um, in general, especially the young population there really um, is favorable towards um, United States culture, um, etc. But back to uh, the events, the United States hasn't assassinated a military leader since World War II, I believe. I'm trying to think of maybe it was a Japanese general. Yes. Okay. I, not... I read that in the New York Times. Okay, no, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, this, at the same time, I have to say that the, the sanctions that the United States has put on Iran um, since the Trump administration left the Iran nuclear deal, which was a UN Security Council resolution that wasn't between the United States and Iran, but was between the entire world and Iran. Um, and when Trump unilaterally pulled out of that, uh, he has installed a, a, a lot of sanctions where uh, it's not only crippled the Iranian economy, but the Persians have felt that the United States has been at war with them for more than a year. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, what is war? <laughs> you know, you know, it's, it's looked at a, a lot of different ways. Um, so I guess the whole world is wondering right now um, how Iran will respond to this particular action. Uh, he was very popular in Iran, like 70-80% support. There were a lot of demonstrations against the Theocratic Republic of Iran the last several months. Now it appears that in the next few weeks there'll be parliamentary elections in Iran and the sort of far-right, more theocratic element of the Theocratic Republic that Iranians live under um, should do very well. <laughs> so it, 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 it's, it's really a huge victory for the right um, in Tehran and those who want to keep the theocratic part of the theocratic republic. And um, it's also a big victory for um, the Islamic State, um, Al-Qaeda. You mean the, the killing of this, this general is a yes. big victory for them? Oh, absolutely, because not only was this general, but also the Iraqi commander mm -hmm. that was killed. Um, you know, keep in mind this, this targeted assassination or possible war crime, if you will, mm -hmm took place in a third country. It took place in Iraq. And um, as a result of that, as, as obviously it's in the news, the Iraqi parliament has um, you know, passed a resolution um, to remove the 5,000 U.S. soldiers from Iraq, um, in part because they were there for two reasons, to fight the Islamic State and to train the Iraqi military. And, and neither of those objectives were fulfilled. In fact, they were both set back um, by the killing of, of Soleimani. Um, so, Right now, the 5,000 U.S. soldiers in Iraq are somewhat hostages in some ways because the United States military um, mission now at this point is to protect them right. from the population and the um, Iraqi military and the um, militias in the country. And so they've stopped their, all of their activities against the Islamic State. I, I'm trying to in Mosul in particular in southern Iraq. So you you yeah. you could possibly see a scenario where um, the Islamic State could rebound to some extent, which could interestingly enough make it easier for Iran to have a stronger foothold in Iraq, um, and also give the United States an argument to keep their soldiers in Iraq. So that could possibly work for both parties. <laughs> I'm really trying hard to understand the, 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 the sequence of events, too. So uh, President Trump claimed that he uh, authorized this attack, this killing, so that, that that general could be stopped from mm -hmm. dangers that he was posing, supposed dangers that he was posing for hundreds mm -hmm. of, of uh, people at embassies and military bases. Yeah. And now, since then, thousands of people are at risk because of possible retaliation. Does that sound, yeah. is that correct? Yeah, yeah. none of those um, details have been provided. There's members of Congress, in particular from the Democratic Party, that are asking for those details. Mm -hmm. um, the administration has said it was an imminent threat. Then they've said it was a future threat. Mm -hmm. They've really argued many things. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they haven't really been consistent on that. Um, Pompeo was asked over the weekend, what those threats were, and he can't really say. Um, the story that's coming out of the region, and it's being reported on Al Jazeera and you know more serious um, news agencies, is that 
he was in fact going to meet to talk about more of a detente between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, that raises a number of other questions because, um, you know, one wonders whether to some extent, I mean, really, let me, if we just go back to the invasion of Iraq in March of 2003, uh, myself and a number of other people, um, public officials and others, and the tens of millions of people around the world who tried to prevent that invasion, uh, one of the things that we said to Grassley and Harkin was that if Iraq's government was toppled, the biggest winner would be Iran. The Iranians would be dancing in the streets because their enemy, Saddam Hussein, <laughs> the Iran-Iraq war mm -hmm. between 80 and 88 took 800,000 people, would be displaced and inevitably Iran would have a dominant role in Iran. Or Iran would have a dominant yeah. role in Iraq. Yeah. I mean, this would this would come to fruition, mm -hmm. and of course, this is what yes. has come to fruition. Yes. Um, you know, so when 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 the administration and others talks about Soleimani and the Iranian militias being active in Iraq, they weren't active in Iraq before two thousand three. Mm -hmm. When they talk about the Islamic State, they also did not exist in Iraq before two thousand three. So. You know, I remember Mubarak at the time of Egypt, he said the gates of hell will, will break out if the United States invades Iraq and topples that government. And, you know, and to some extent, he's been correct because the aftermath of that, um, we can see today in, in so many different ways. Um, and Iran's reaction to it, I mean, maybe this is, I'm talking too much and all over the place, but Iran's reaction to this it, more, most recently has been we are going to begin maneuvers to try to remove U.S. military bases from Western Asia. Now, this is an interesting statement because it says Western Asia. He didn't say Southwestern Asia. So, you know, in some ways this may be strategic because the President of the United States, when he was campaigning, talked about how, you know, maybe forces and there needed to be some drawdown um, in that particular region. Um, but it also raises a, a number of, of, of questions. Um, Hezbollah, which is a Lebanese group that is affiliated with Iran, but is a local indigenous movement that was originally created to try to expel um, Israeli military forces from Lebanese soil when Israel invaded Lebanon. That's what, how Hezbollah got its start. Um, their leader, Nasrallah, has said that U.S. civilians should not be killed. U.S. civilians should not be killed mm -hmm. because that would be playing into the hands of, of the President of the United States. Okay. Um, and there hasn't been clear calls for um, sort of terrorism, per se, um, from Iran, at least not as strong as the call for terrorism from the U.S. President, who said, in fact, that cultural sites in Iran um, may be bombed, which, of course, is a international war crime. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit unusual to have a, a United States president, I'm trying to think of the last time this happened, to publicly state that he may engage in war crimes. I mean, there's a lot of U.S. presidents that have engaged in war crimes in the future, but, but few that have tweeted out that they... That they and so I actually... Yeah, I've, got, I've got that tweet pulled up here. This was from uh, January 5th, about about 2 p.m., yeah. I think. Yeah. These media posts will serve as notification to the United States Congress that should Iran strike any U.S. person or target, the United States will quickly and fully strike back, and perhaps in a disproportionate manner. Such legal notice is not required, but it is given nevertheless. This is the way he's notifying Congress yeah. instead of you know, consulting yeah. with Congress or coordinating with Congress about it. And and you, as I think, I think you just yeah. mentioned, he, he wants to... Um, yeah retaliate if if Iran retaliate, retaliates against us he wants to strike back with 52 different sites some of them yeah. cultural sites that yeah. are important to we're talking about the people of Iran right. now we're not talking about yeah you know I mean it would government. essentially be akin to um, you know a, a foreign president um, you know saying that they would attack the religious shrine of Disney right. of Disney you know for example um, you know <laughs> So, I, I went to that as a kid. I, I wasn't converted, though. I won't go back. But, but, you have a, but you have a situation 
now where UNESCO, the United Nations Education Scientific Cultural Organization, is taking this seriously. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it's, a, it's a peculiar thing because there's a lot of people in the United States that, that, that don't take this president seriously, but, but a lot of people around the world don't know what to make of the things that he has said. I mean, I, I, I suppose if we, in another segment, if we talk about some of his recent statements on Afghanistan, yes. you, know, you wonder also how the Afghans um, take it. But, but I think it's a serious situation because we just don't know um, from moment to moment how serious um, you know, that, that this president is on, on, a, on a number of these fronts. Um, and um, you know, his party has become you know, much more like a personality cult rather than a political party, which is, once again, is not unusual. Political parties become that, mm -hmm. and especially in presidential republics. It's quite common, and that's our form of government. Um, but so, yeah, there's just a lot of... Um, Iranians are actually tweeting out um, cultural sites and, and sending them to the president. You know, their photos, they're sending out um, cultural sites. Um, yeah. Etc. Um, Just to show that they're, these are people. Yeah, they're these there. Are not military targets. Exactly. What, With what people have, around them, yeah. What have you seen as far as response to this from some of the presidential candidates, the Democratic presidential mm -hmm. candidates? Do you see any significant responses to this? Yeah, I, I think personally it's, it's, been, it's been pretty reassuring, at least from what I've heard from um, Joe Biden, from Bernie Sanders. Um, Elizabeth Warren, uh, those are the three that I, I heard some statement from. But I think that really the Democratic Party right now has been uh, pretty strong in terms of not only raising a lot of questions, but the War Powers Resolution that Congress, the House of Representatives at least, is set to pass and then um, the Senate will ignore uh, it is important because it's, it's symbolic. Um, one of the things that I've seen from the House of Representatives, which is, I think, interesting, is consistently saying Article One gives Congress the power to declare war, and um, you know I, that I don't think that that has, has has been as strong in either party for quite some time. Um, it used to be the the, the so-called conservatives that were um, concerned about you know runaway executive power. And sort of a, the imperial presidency, et cetera. But now, interesting how times change. It's sort of the liberals that that are that are more vocal on on some of these things. Although I went I went call what we have in Washington D.C. conservatives. There's probably a few conservatives, and, and most of them are in the Democratic Party. But um, so, but when it comes to um, so, I, I've actually been pretty pleased with with some of the reaction. I thought Bernie Sanders was particularly strong because he right away traced this back to the invasion of Iraq and talked mm -hmm. about even some of the things that I've talked about in terms of, you know, this was really an inevitable consequence of uh, the invasion of, of Iraq. Now, I haven't seen, but and maybe you've noticed, it, Gabbard has been sort of the, the, the anti-war candidate mm -hmm. so far. Have you mm -hmm. seen something from her? I personally haven't, but I'm guessing that she will say this is could be another regime change war. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it will get to that point I I you know in terms of how Iran will respond um, I don't anticipate that Iran will have a conventional military response I don't anticipate that Iran will respond in any way for some time but we'll see because uh, you know I, I think everything changes if the United States starts bombing the territory of Iran um, I'm guessing that Iran will um, probably try to uh, boost its uh, nuclear program. Um, you know, now that the United States has left the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, that that would be possibly um, if Iran did a nuclear test, you know, months from now, uh, that would be news. But I'm, I'm guessing that, that Iran has a lot of options and I, I don't think they're reckless. I mean, they can't win a war of any kind against the United States. Um, and so I'm, I'm guessing that they'll probably be pretty, pretty deliberate um, with, with, um, with how they respond. Um, they have allies in the region, a lot of allies in the region, and um, Iran has been the most important country in the world to fight the Islamic State and to fight Al-Qaeda. What, what about so, some of the U.S. allies? What, what has been the response? 
Well, before this happened, there was some discussion, more discussion between some further detente between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Um, Saudi Arabia can't really afford serious hostilities with Iran because a lot of their oil is in a Shia region of, of, of Saudi Arabia um, that really there's a lot of uh, dissidents there that, you know, people who are opposed to the absolute monarchy and sort of being second class citizens in the, in the um, royal kingdom. So, you know, Iran or the Houthi rebels uh, using a drone months ago to attack the <coughs> Saudi oil fields. Um, you know, just in terms of the export of oil and, and their economy, Saudi Arabia, uh, a war with Iran is, is, is probably not on their agenda. And so um, Israel tends to uh, stand bes beside the United States. Um, I, I think the last vote, the blockade against Cuba as being illegal and immoral, it was 190 to 2, and it's usually the United States and, and, and Israel. So. Israel tends to stand behind the United States almost whatever they do, um, but um, you know it's it's just a fluid situation. Um, there can be a lot of uh, there could be a lot of groups that attack the United States that are not directly linked to Iran. I'm worried about people of Iranian descent living in the United States, citizens here. Uh, do you think that we're going to see some of the same? reaction against people because of their connection to Iran? People, I, yeah, people who support Trump's decision. Have you heard yeah. of any of that happening yet? No, I, I hope not, but the BBC and some European media is already reporting some harassment of Iranian Americans at the border, um, people who uh, you know have passports and are coming in on, on planes. Iran was, in fact, part of the, the Muslim ban. Um, and so, uh, you know, those Iranian Americans who are in the United States, um, who are studying and who find it difficult or nearly impossible to travel back home, mm. um, I, I agree with you that there should be concern. Um, I remember during the Gulf War, uh, when we were in college, um, we had, mm -hmm. there were some Iraqis who um, were harassed on campus at mm -hmm. the F by the FBI. And um, I remember we had dinner with a few of them. Uh, the, one of the first nights of the bombing and we would just sort of go outside and knock on the door that the, the FBI person and, <laughs> and introduce ourselves and ask him if he was enjoying our conversations in there and everything oh, but God. so we actually had some fun with it but so I I, I mean Did I you think offer them a piece of pizza I yeah I mean it really wouldn't have been a problem they're probably you know decent guys are probably really sure. bored but having to answer orders or, or choosing to answer orders from above mm -hmm. um, you know yeah, but anyhow, that's oh no. I mean, I, that's a real, real experience that that people, um, you know. And, and our position on campus was really that we felt that if we are moral, decent people, and if we're <coughs> hospitable to people, that if our country's going to war, that we shouldn't go to war um, with innocent people what's, who what's are just school? happen to be at, at Iowa State University. Iowa State. Yeah, when I was at Iowa State, okay. um, and so yeah, and so. Well, that takes me back. <laughs> now that you asked that question, but we won't tell all yeah. the stories from. Congress. No, no, no. I'm not won't. telling mine. We no, we won't. We won't <laughs> even. No, we won't venture there. But so yeah, I mean, this is a concern, and, and we'll we'll see where it goes. I mean, there's already enough um, brutality, you know, at the border and um, cruelty with with the Muslim ban. Okay. Um, so yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to take a short break. Uh, when we come back, Jeffrey will continue our talk, and we'll talk a little bit about Afghanistan as okay. well. Um, this is Jeffrey Weiss with Kathy Burns on the Fallon Forum, and we'll be back in a moment. <laughs> Welcome back to the Fallon Forum. This is Kathy Burns subbing for Ed Fallon, who has laryngitis still. I'm here with Jeffrey Weiss, and we're continuing our conversation. We were talking about what's going on with Iran, and um, originally you were going to come on and talk just mainly about Afghanistan before the whole mm -hmm. Iran thing blew up. So um, let's let's hear a little bit about the background of um, the situation with, <coughs> excuse me, the Afghanistan papers, and mm -hmm. and we we can even talk about how all this plays into the Iran situation now. But just okay. give us a little brief on that. Yeah, it's. Um, you know, it's we can go a lot of different places because right now uh, the United States is engaged in bombing um, seven countries, I believe, maybe eight now. Um, 
on a routine basis. Um, and six out of ten dollars, sixty cents of every dollar of our discretionary budget goes to the Pentagon. Sixty cents of every sixty dollar. cents of every dollar of our discretionary budget. The last discretionary budget was one point three trillion, and the Pentagon got about what seven hundred to eight hundred billion. By the way, that's not even counting the nuclear weapons in the Department of Energy. Or VA, which VA will okay. get a ninety billion dollar check or something too, which I'm glad they do yes. publicly, yep. publicly delivered, publicly paid for. But let's healthcare. make that less necessary in the future. Yeah, I mean what everybody has in the UK with the National Health Service, mm -hmm. the NHS. But um, and so you know one of the strange things about being a United States citizen that is unique around the world is that pretty much whenever you've been born, your country has been a state of perpetual war. Mm -hmm. And I mean I, I can't emphasize like how strange that is <laughs> you know and, and we're used to it it's sort of like breathing um, but um, you know we might ask ourselves even what that does to us psychologically um, you know and etc but that's that's a, that's a separate show it makes peace um, seem like like a, a very remote possibility yeah, yeah. you know and, and very much not a part of our real lives which is a shame well and, and war is profitable I mean you see when the stock market fell after the assassination of, of Soleimani, um, some stocks did pretty well, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, etc. When you read Kiplinger's, the investment magazines, and you talk about the stocks to buy for 2020, you know you find those weapons contractors and those in those stocks. So war is profitable. You know it's funny. A lot of politicians run around saying nobody wants war, but that's actually false. I mean, war, the military-industrial complex that that Eisenhower warned about us that that it would destroy the republic. Um, and, and Afghanistan is part of that. Well, there's kind of a history of wars popping up shortly before elections, too. Yeah. Is that, am I imagining that, or is that well, founded? You know, we don't really know if it's strategic or if it's based on impulse. Um, maybe we'll never know. But, um, you know, it's been reported over and over that this particular president accused the last president of right. possibly waging right. a war against Iran um, to distract um, from impeachment. Well, it, it wasn't impeachment in the case of Obama, but, you know, so there's, there's some talk about that. But, you know, when it comes to Afghanistan, <laughs> we've been in Afghanistan since October <coughs> 2002. I mean, this is the longest war, what almost two times or three times as long as, as World War II. I remember that because um, I was still teaching at that time. Yeah. And mm -hmm. my students had a strong, re well, you know, I, I watched the students watch the, mm -hmm. the, the Twin Towers get attacked mm -hmm. live. Mm -hmm. and, and it was one of, the, one of the worst moments of my life and mm -hmm. theirs, of course. But then I remember when, when war started, it, I just walked around in a daze thinking, oh, this, yeah. this, this hasn't happened since I've been an adult. Yeah, and and I don't want it to happen to those kids either. And well, they're they're grown absolutely. ups now, and they're yeah. still in a state of war. Well, and when we get back to September 11, I mean, we were attacked by 15 uh, foreign nationals from Saudi Arabia, um, one from Egypt, one from United or two from United Arab Emirates, and one from Lebanon. And Afghanistan, of course, was attacked because yeah. this was the place that where Al Qaeda, um, you know, and were harboring um, Bin Laden. Um, what we found out in the Afghanistan papers is that the United States has been spent several trillion dollars um, in this war, um, also along with the invasion and occupation of Iraq, uh, and that throughout the generals, the political leaders um, have been lying to the United States public um, about the war, about the success in the war. Um, I guess some shades of, of, of Vietnam in terms of, you know, we're turning the corner. Um, and when, when do these papers become available? Um, I believe that they came from the Inspector General's office and that they were, I think it was three or four years of um, going through the Freedom of Information Act that the Washington Post uh, received them. So, I mean, it was, it was a pretty long process for, for this information um, to come out. Um, you know, I, I believe the State Department, one of the, the State Department officials said, you know, they didn't have to go for this three or four year process. They could have gone on websites and, and read some of this information. And there's probably some truth to that. But, uh, you know, my limited understanding of this is that the Washington Post um, wanted a lot more information and they were able to get um, statements from military people that were made internally and also statements from military people that were made to the press, which oftentimes were quite different, <laughs> not surprisingly so. Um, I mean, we, tend, we have a long history of our government and our military um, lying to us 
um, about war. Uh, what do they say? The first casualty of war is truth. Um, you know, and in the case of Afghanistan, um, you know, what has this given? I mean, we've had about 18 years. We've had um, thousands of, of um, you know, our own soldiers um, killed and wounded. We've had uh, how many tens of thousands of Afghan civilians? The other interesting thing about this is while there's so much talk about um, there's so much veneration of, of, of veterans by politicians, you actually look at polls and some of the people most critical about this and who are reacting the strongest to the Afghanistan papers are our former veterans. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, and who are some of the most vocal, although largely censored by corporate mm -hmm. media and NPR mm -hmm. and, and our mainstream media, uh, their voices are largely censored, the, the political dissent. Um, coming from them, and, and I think what, tell, I think this would be a good voice. Tell me what you mean voice. by their voices are largely censored. Well, you I mean, just not. Yeah, not, no, you you just saying things, but nobody's. Reporting. I mean, you can get you know NPR might have call-in shows where there was one I heard this morning about Iran where a guy called in and he said he was an Afghan war veteran, mm -hmm. but there isn't you know an hour show on NPR where you have veterans who are opposed to war or who are in favor of peace. Um, actually having a chance to say something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, I, when you get me started on NPR these days, I, I you know, it's, it's so many I, programs. I, I almost <laughs> use my IPR mug to drink on. Well, you know, my cranberry it's sad to say, uh, National Public Radio is the best that we can do, but I've, I, um, you know, I just sort of joke that, that one day NPR will, uh, they will continue to report the fall of the republic through, is it good for the Democrats? Is it good for the Republicans? Um, what about the next election? Um, I remember the day after Soleimani was assassinated, one of the NPR reporters, I had to turn it off, but on the early morning show, it's like, why didn't we do this earlier? Um, there's a wonderful documentary called War Made Easy, and it's really well done that... War for Dummies, kind of? Well, it, it just notes how corporate media and NPR and PBS normalize United States foreign policy. I mean, things that are so much in violation of international law and so far outside the spectrum of normalcy in the world are normalized as some sort of debate between the two parties. Um, and what's good for each party and what's not good for each party. For example, um, President Trump's tweets on Afghanistan have gotten very little press, but you know, a couple, on a couple of occasions he said, I could end the war on Afghanistan by killing 10 million people, but I don't want to. Um, in another one, he talked about killing more than 10 million people. I'm not joking. And you mean through the military? Yeah. Through bombing or, or how? Um, I assume that would be possibly, I would guess that the Afghans would hear that as possibly a nuclear weapon. Oh, That's gosh. what I'm guessing. But, but then again, it could be that we have, you know, that kind of carpet bombing capacity. But for him to say that publicly, I mean, can, you can imagine another leader publicly saying that, you know, we could do this to the Americans and start talking about numbers, what kind of an outcry that would be. Yes. So I often think that, that, that um, when it comes to foreign policy in particular, um, even with Afghanistan and with Iran, um, Robert Fisk of The Independent of London says, when it comes to foreign policy, he calls it U.S. officials said media. Media tend to just repeat what U.S. officials say. So if the Democratic Party, for example, isn't opposed to what is happening in foreign policy, then neither will there be voices of dissent in media. That's why I'm happy that the Democratic Party has been speaking mm -hmm. out against, um, you know, some of, some of what is actually um, uh, taking place. And, and I think the other part is um, George Bush Sr., who was, you know, pretty honest, right after the fall of the Soviet Union, he says, this is the new world order, what we say goes. That's one, two, three, four. Oh. What we say goes. He was on an aircraft carrier when he said that. I remember I was with a friend of mine from South Africa. Um, we kind of looked at each other like, wow, we're in for a ride. This is going to be fun. But um, what we say goes. That's pretty clear. I mean, that's pretty clear. In other words, don't question beyond what you hear yeah. from our mouths. Yeah, there, there really, there really are, are very few rules when it comes to United States foreign policy in terms of a, a media that is being critical. Um, it got play over the weekend when Pompeo was asked about the tweet about bombing cultural sites. Mm -hmm. And he waffled on the question and then he finally succumbed by saying the United States would follow um, 
the rule of law. And the reporter left him off the hook because the reporter should have yeah, said they have international law or, or U.S. law because mm -hmm. U.S. law really isn't clear. U.S. law probably theoretically would give a president a unilateral right to, you know, to throw a nuclear weapon on another country. But that would be a gross violation of international law, crime against humanity, uh, you know. But, but so we tend to operate in, in, a, in a bubble where it seems like uh, our, our, our media and our intellectual culture have sort of forgot the Nuremberg principles, you know. Um, you hear people <laughs> walk around and say things like, you know, there are no rules to war. And I'm like, wow, I, uh, you ever heard of World War II? You know, this... <laughs> yeah, all is fair in love and war. <laughs> the Tokyo war crimes, you know, can, you know, et cetera. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I guess I'm talking kind of off the subject of Afghanistan, but it's all related mm -hmm. to sort of a background of how I also blame our media, um, our mainstream media, especially for you know, normalizing an 18-year occupation and, and not asking the, the questions that should be asked of our political leaders, both Democrat what, and Republican. What question would you ask? This, we'll, we'll kind of wrap up with, what would be your dream question? Oh boy, the dream question. Um, well, I would ask if the United States still abides by the Nuremberg Principles. Mm -hmm. One would be, and then um, if they say yes, then how do you justify a threat on civilian targets? Um, you know, okay. yeah. I mean, that that would be that would be a, a simple that would be a simple question. But that's a good question. But so there's actually a cha lot. That challenge ask. to other media um, folks. Jeffrey has the question, yeah. <laughs> the dream question here. Th these are the things that we need to know. Yeah. Um, so much to talk about, and we yeah. really appreciate uh, your expertise, your insight. This has been Kathy Burns on the Fallon Forum with Jeffrey Weiss. Thanks for listening. Thank you.